Gunshek, the percussionist, on Sunday, May 3rd, 1992, at the Tower Theater. We don't know yet uh, exactly where the tickets will be sold in advance, but you can call Jacqueline here, and hopefully she'll know soon. Uh, tonight's reading is, of course, Corinne Hales and Liza Whelan, and I think the most telling comment I could make about both of these writers is that really and truly, they deserve to be introduced by Pete Everwine, um, <laughs> but they get me instead. Um, Connie is the author of Underground, which was published in 1986, and of January Fire, a chapbook that was published by Devil's Mill Hoppers Press. Uh, her poems have appeared recently in the Southern Review, New England Review, Plowshares, and Kenyon Review. She teaches at Fresno State, and I hope she always will. And I'd like you to welcome Connie Hales. Thank you. Um, for some reason, all the poems that I picked out to read, I just realized have fire. Uh, there's something about fire in them. I, not all of them, but most of them. I don't know what that means. Um, but I'll start with a couple uh, older poems. This one is uh, about um, a couple of kids who find uh, a sparrow dying in their yard um, and what they do about it. Taking good care of my brother. I've exposed the whole underside of a fallen sparrow with the flick of my boot's toe. Maggots, the belly is raw, crawling with disease. The bird squawks and one brown wing beats time desperately at the dirt. My little brother cries. He believes I can heal it if I want to. I believe there is no hope. They say when the time comes, a bird will push her half grown to the edge and over. Who can blame her? How could she possibly know something is so wrong? I can't make myself touch it. My brother, hands clamped over his ears, becomes pure vision, shutting out all reason. And the terrible screeching that comes from both their mouths at once demands a miracle I can't provide. I scoop the bird into a tin can and carry it further into the yard where we are burning paper trash in a black oil drum. My, my brother watching, I toss the thing quick toward the flames and the bird, out of my hands, starts to fly. Without hesitation, it flies straight as if the miracle had happened into the hot, bright heart of the fire. Now, oh, I'm more nervous reading here than anywhere in the world, I think. <laughs> uh, this one's also about fire. It's, um, when John and I were in graduate school, we lived in a rundown neighborhood in Salt Lake City. And one night in the middle of winter, um, sort of um, rooming house uh, burnt down. And it was one of those places where the landlord turns off the, rent, the heat and uh, people are left to heat their rooms with um, space heaters. Um, so that's how the fire started. This was right down the street from where we live. January fire. Third Avenue flop house. We are neighbors, so we tell them what we can. We think one man is unaccounted for. We're not sure, we don't know his name or anything about him, but he's been here every day for weeks. We've all seen him sitting there on the steps, mumbling to himself. Maybe he couldn't get out in time. Maybe there are more. I have to keep, I have to keep turning my back to stand this heat. Ten below zero and the foam sprayed thick from fire hoses is flash freezing on the dark side of everything it touches. We had been making love when the sudden brightness outside lit up the whole inside of our room. We could see each other clearly. Pulling on clothes and coats and scarves, we rushed out, following sirens into the night. The firemen say there's no chance of getting back inside. Uninjured residents huddle on the sidewalk, waiting for someone to find them a place to go. They think the fire was caused by electric heaters and old wiring, an overload. The night is so cold and the place was poorly heated. 
No news about the missing man. I watch flames shoot through the roof, my breath appearing and disappearing in front of my face. A charred sofa, pulled from the porch, sits in the street encased in ice like some long extinct animal waiting to come alive at the touch of sunlight or a human hand. But there's no sign of any thaw on the way. Tomorrow, ice a foot thick will cover everything. At first light, this big willow will glisten, branches oddly bent toward what's left of the building. Firemen will have to chop through icy rubble with picks and axes in their search for the one possible fatality. And I won't even be here when at last they bring that body out. They will say the fire probably started in his room and that the smoke probably got him first but it is the weight of the ice that finally makes the walls collapse on top of him, dead or alive. I will dream for weeks of frozen embers, flames preserved in blocks of ice. You and I walk home toward dawn, afraid to speak, our tongues coated with the taste of ash and smoke. I tell myself there's nothing we can do. Even so, I'll come back day after day through this winter, hoping to see a change hoping to be there when the ice begins to melt, setting free whatever is trapped inside. Um, this one's a newer poem. Um, when I was in junior high school, we walked home past a little grocery store uh, run by a, an old couple. And uh, we used to steal things from the store, and they, uh, the old man would chase us out. And the old woman, his wife, felt sorry for us and would call us back and give us candy and soda pop, and he would chase us out again. So it was kind of this game. And uh, this poem is sort of uh, based on that store. It's called Storm. No coat. Bad shoes caught sudden in a spring downpour, a girl scrambles into a small market on her way home from school. The old man is alone, picking out bruised apples from a bin, tossing them softly, one at a time, into a slop can. Usually, he chases kids out, having caught them lifting chocolate bars and cigarettes often enough, but today he looks up, smiles a little, glances toward the glass doors darkened by sheeting rain, and the girl feels safe begins leafing through a magazine from the rack. At the next flash and crack of thunder, the old man walks to the door, presses both thick hands to the glass, and asks if the girl has ever been to California. He says he and his wife saved all their lives to go to the ocean. Then he says she died last week. The girl doesn't know what to do. He isn't even looking at her hair dripping onto her shoulders, the damp arms of her shirt clinging to her skin. He seems to be speaking through the door, straight into the storm. He tells how it happened, a slight headache, a couple of aspirin, how she wiped the crumbs from the kitchen table and checked the stove before going to bed. Then there was that odd sound in the night, a cough, and the cold morning realization that he had slept through her leaving. The girl doesn't want to hear this. The room has become close, steamy, the air thick with the slop bucket's ripeness. The man's trousers are baggy and too short, and one brown sock droops around the top of his shoe, a dull rubber-soled Oxford. Rain seeps in onto the floor, glistening at his feet. How far is California, the girl asks, twisting at her magazine. He turns, his face glowing against the dark glaze of the door. She is 13. She has never seen a man cry before, and he moves slowly toward her, his hands reaching out like a blind man, mouth open, making a kind of moan. She takes his hands, lets him fall to his knees, unbutton her wet shirt, and press his burning face to her heart. Um, this one I... I wasn't going to read here because I've um, read it a couple of times in Fresno, and uh, I thought everybody would be tired of it, but uh, somebody asked me today, and I was <coughs> flattered, so I'm going to read it anyway. Um, there's a, 
there are two, um, there are three little sections and uh, two incidents in here that, um, that you might want to know about before. One is that, uh, based on an incident that happened in my neighborhood when I was a kid, a, a man actually murdered his own little son and some kids in the neighborhood found the body, which was, uh, sort of became legendary quickly. And um, the other one is this, uh, another incident happened in the late 70s in Salt Lake City. A woman took her children to this uh, big Salt Lake City hotel and uh, rented a room high up on the 15th floor and um, for what she thought were religious reasons. Her husband had killed himself the night before. They were going to go join him. She, she started throwing her children out the windows. And uh, so that's what this is about. It's called Testimony. On the way to church, we'd pass the place. The neighbor boy's body had been found a few days after his father beat in his brown-haired head with a quart-sized root beer bottle. The first day, we made ourselves go straight to the spot. Some broken glass, a bare space in the field, the dirt turned a little as if someone had thought of a garden and given it up. Nothing else. After that, we began to swerve, making a new path through thick summer weeds. Inside scrub church walls, the world looked different. Soft-edged women sat, fanning themselves slowly with pastel cardboard fans, moving only their slender wrists, staring out into the blue air. Babies slept easily in their laps, safe, believing in good mothers who would catch them if they rolled and hold them if they cried. One by one, people stood, moved to testify to their faith in a merciful Jesus. Turning faces toward the smooth white ceiling, they'd give thanks and plead for their lives. At 17, I'd already learned what a man could do to me if he chose to. Each new time he climbed on top of me, I was trusting him with my life. He'd hold my wrist between his thumb and finger, saying, I could snap this in a second, or your arm or your neck, and I knew the rancid taste of gratitude when he let me live. That may be why, on a hot August morning, when I first saw my own baby, I was overcome by the uneasy revelation that giving birth is not giving life. Birth had been mostly out of my control, but those tiny wrists, her fingers, her delicate wobbly head told me clearly that she was at my mercy. I'd have to decide again every day to let her live. When the woman on the 15th floor began throwing her children out the window, one by one, the citizens of Salt Lake City were powerless to stop her. We ran back and forth in the streets below, begging her to have mercy on the children. We would have given her anything, money, our houses and cars, even love, to save one of those fallen bodies. And we would have fallen happily to our own knees in the ripe gratitude of an errant child whose punishment on a whim has been miraculously rescinded. But mercy, after all, is just another word for power. And on that clean city sidewalk, as we covered up what was left, we began to understand our position. She was closer to her ancient, to her ancient God than any of us could imagine. And she had accepted the terrible responsibility that comes with being above other people. Uh, this next one's newer also. Um, it's, uh, it's pretty self-explanatory, I think. It's called Collapse. And um, it's for my husband, John. Today, your friend has fallen while riding his bicycle to the market, losing both, losing both balance and vision, an inflamed tumor pushing hard on the perfect brain spot to decrease function on his body's whole right side. You are both approaching 40, his curly red hair just beginning to gray, and all week he's been laughing at your first pair of glasses. You are married with children. He is gay and lives alone. An ex-Mormon, a lapsed Catholic, odd expatriates of faith, both still slightly possessed by the vocational shame of the body. 
Even on hot California days, you both wear baggy layers of shirts and sweatshirts, uncomfortable residents of your physical skin. Melanoma has turned inward, worked its way to the bone and the brain. You run your fingers along his bent bicycle frame, paint flaking off deep new scratches. You convince him to go back to the hospital. In the emergency room, you notice your friend can no longer push his toes in or out of his sandals, can't fasten the buckle, has difficulty signing his name. His doctor can't be reached, so they pump his thin body with steroids, painkillers, and IV pouch rising like a balloon from his wrist. They ask him if he lives alone. He hesitates, desperate to go home, so you say, no, I'll be with him. And the ER doctor, relieved, signs release papers, writes prescriptions, and you all shake hands, that awkward intimacy between men, as if agreeing to some solemn, unspoken pact. You head out toward the parking lot, leaning against each other, talking about food and politics and poetry, avoiding the conspicuous avoiding the conspicuous shuffle of that right foot, the terrible bone scan from last month, the show of blood in the most recent spinal tap, the color of a good Zinfandel, the oncologist had said. The night sky is unusually clear, and you make plans to drive to the mountains next week. But on the way home, your friend pees on himself and begins to curse, blaming you for driving too slow. At his apartment, when he tries to say goodnight quick at the door, you have to insist on coming in at least to see him safely into bed. You call your wife, let her know where you are, and then your friend collapses. His right leg folds and he is down flat on the kitchen floor. You have never seen such rage. He is screaming, get out. I don't want you here. I don't need your help. This is my house. You have no right. You pull a beer from the refrigerator, walk past him into the living room and open a window. Outside, a few gangly teenagers are laughing, throwing punches at each other in the night air under a porch light across the street. You think of your mother. Close your eyes, touch your own face where a doctor once removed a small, scaly patch of bad skin. You try to imagine. You wait for the screaming to stop. Exhausted, he allows you, la he allows you at last to get him a drink of water, wash his face, pull off his wet blue jeans and find him a clean pair of shorts. You joke a little, it seems better. He gives you permission to stay a while longer, to heat up some soup and dry crackers to help him finally into bed. But sometime in the night, your friend wakes in a nightmare, finds himself pissing in his bed and crashes violently to the floor trying to get up. You go to him, walk him like a sleepy child to the bathroom pull off his clothes in darkness and stand next to him at the toilet, not saying a word. You are both crying. How has kindness become so much like betrayal? One man's love somehow seals the other's fate. The useless right side sags and you sway into each other, making your way down the narrow hallway to the bedroom where you sit your friend on the floor, change his wet sheets, stoop, wrap both arms tight around him, pull his thin body gently into bed and hold him close. Um, this next one, uh, I read in, in an earlier version a couple of years ago here, but it's better now, so I'm going to read it again. I think it's better now. Uh, and it's longer, so um, it'll be the last poem I read. Um, it's based on a, well, about three or four years ago, there was an uh, air show accident in Germany that killed a lot of people. And one of the people that was killed there was a boy I grew up with. So that's sort of the genesis of this poem. Um, it's called Consummation, and it has an epigraph from a news story. <coughs> Traveling at about 350 miles per hour, three Italian jets slammed together 200 feet above the main runway of Ramstein U.S. Air Base in West Germany and plunged into thousands of spectators below, 
spewing fire and airplane parts over tents, cars, barbecue grills, and people. It was the worst air show accident in history. After school, the day John Kennedy died, we drove your red Chevy fast and terrified to the lake where we held on tight until midnight and after. I remember screeching seagulls, the slight sting of saltwater air, your face in the last light, and how even the polished cherry wood knob on the stick shift seemed to shine softly in dash glow as we began slowly to make ourselves whole again by simple touch. From that day on, the world got steadily colder, and we learned to trust only the heat and power of our own joined bodies, the clean rhythmic <coughs> energy we discovered night after night wrapped in the loose patchwork quilt you carried against whatever bad news was on its way. I learned by heart the precise geography of your 16-year-old chest, and my fingers memorized the smooth hollow near your throat. After all these years, you call out of nowhere. Tell me you're in California and want us to get together before you leave. So halfway to the coast one afternoon, I find myself waiting anxiously at a roadside diner. You've rejoined the army, but look good anyway, and we fall quickly into our own, and we fall quickly into our old argument, the circumstance that has squeezed our lives into their current ragged shapes. But that was last year, before I saw news footage of the horrible Italian jets bursting into flaming chunks, exploding into crowds caught in mid-cheer, and into a medevac helicopter fueled and waiting on the sidelines. You'd think a person would know if a loved one were involved in one of those documented tragedies that show up so persistently on TV. <coughs> but I'd watch the thing replayed dozens of times before someone called to tell me you were there. During the two weeks it has taken you to die in the burn unit of a Texas military hospital, time has become strangely twisted. I'm speaking to you now as if you were alive. I keep watching this film of fire crashing down on an American air base in Germany. People keep calling with grim detail <coughs> how long you were conscious, the extent of your burns, your last words to your family, the exact condition of your beautiful skin. At 15, I believed we'd always be in love. We were the chosen ones who'd make it out of our sorry neighborhood, have a life in the suburbs, eat steak and shrimp, go to work every day in clean, happy offices, <coughs> like all those pretty people in John F. Kennedy's Television America. It was a space age. We were the greatest, greenest country in the world, and the future smelled so sweet. It almost didn't matter that your mother had lost another tired job that my house had no heat and smelled soggy with boiled cabbage, dirty diapers, and too many runny-nosed kids. By then, my crazy father and his hopeless anger had been taken away for good. I had a job cleaning motel rooms, and you, you had a car. For that brief adolescent moment, it really looked like America was going to let us in. But the future was already rising across the eastern sky, prying at us with its blood-stained fingers, and before either of us understood why, you'd already answered the nation's first chilling knock at our neighborhood's door. I am talking to a dead man. In this photo, you are holding a beautiful Vietnamese child on your lap. I wish I could bring her home, your letter said. She has no life here anymore. Why not, I wrote back. Angry for answers, I had only questions. Who killed her family anyway? What are you doing there so far from home and working for everything I hate? Had you forgotten the photographs, the burning Buddhist monks, so brilliantly consumed by their own human desire, their unswerving faith in the good public dream? They made no compromises. Hadn't we seen the same pictures? Someone was trying to change the subject. By 1966, a nervous citizen had already shot a 22 caliber hole through my brother's leg for stealing gasoline. I was pregnant and lying my way through high school, working nights pressure cooking chicken in hot grease and watching good mothers and ministers feed the best of our young bodies methodically into the hungry national machine, grinding out democracy, democracy, democracy. Recruiters cruised the schools like pimps with their spit-shined rhetoric draft threats, powerful promises. You could smell smoke on any American street. 
the attempt to settle our differences is still, I suppose, going on. Here at this diner, over coffee and hot cherry pie, you try again to convince me I should go to church. You tell me God and the army have given you the life we dreamed about as kids. I tell you I've given myself that life. I have good work, a house, furniture, a family almost grown. It looks like both of us have made it. But for some reason, as if we are survivors of some cosmic extermination plot, we each feel chronically compelled to convince the other of the rightness of our separate escapes. You keep playing with the salt shaker, making neat white lines with your fingers that scatter across the table as we talk. I think about the specific slow heat generated by the joining of hands and the distinct hot sting of a slap. I want to touch your face. Vietnam was nearly half our lives ago, and you look forward to peacetime assignment in Germany. Your family will be with you, and you'll be flying some kind of helicopter ambulance for the Army. This is the dream you say you've lived for. I wonder if it's worth it to sell yourself for any middle-aged American dream. What choice do we have, you ask me? What choice did we ever have? What did the likes of us have to offer except our own bodies? I guess it's true. You sold your body to God, LB, you sold your body to God, LBJ and Richard Nixon. I sold mine to a man with a job and have had to steal what was left of it back. You and I spent the entire summer you returned arguing these things while my husband worked the mines outside Salt Lake City. Everything was out of place. You'd become the enemy I'd been working against and I had to make you see it my way. We planted a garden, spinach, tomatoes, peppers, peas. You helped me bake bread. We smoked a little, we talked, we touched. We took my daughter to the park. We tried hard to help each other heal. But the deep invisible seam that, that once joined, but the deep invisible seam that once had joined us so securely at the edges of our skin had pulled apart in the strain of making choices we used to imagine we were free to make. How did we end up in these opposite camps? The heroic immolation of Buddhist monks had given way in Life magazine to new photos of flaming napalm children running frantically away from whatever public passion they were being called upon to fuel. What better life had been promised them by the cool national knock at their village door? You said I didn't understand. But hadn't you and I decided to climb together, pulling the others with us out of the grim pit of our beginnings? What happened to that strong, singular will? That spring, at the city zoo, we watched a deer give birth. The spindly, awkward thing dropped almost accidentally to the ground, almost accidentally to the ground, squirmed desperately for a few hard minutes, the mother licking for all she was worth until finally the legs took hold and a new creature found the only way to make its life. You began that summer to go back to church. It had some connection to the war. You said you had to believe in God's blessing a country that promised to pay you back with a regular job, college education, and medical care for the asking. I watched the foreign sheets of fire rain down on what has turned out to be your middle-aged body. Two weeks and many faraway phone calls later, I sit in the <coughs> California garden staring out at the bluest sky, still scared and angry that we've been pitted so squarely against each other all these years. A mockingbird chases a squirrel loudly out of the crepe myrtle onto a sagging power line. The cat purrs, rubs its satisfied back against my ankle, and I'm suddenly sure we should have left that reunion diner last year together, driven all the way to the coast, tried one more time to touch our way back to the pure physical strength of a common purpose. But both of us were too far gone by then, and love is a very expensive commodity. We hugged a clumsy goodbye at our separate cars, and I sped back across the valley to my good life, knowing that most of the others we grew up with were already dead or living at the bottom, still balanced on the lowest rung of some narrow imaginary ladder leading up to this national dream where the, climb turns out, where the climb turns out to be nothing but a lonely deal you have to make with a world you can't trust for anything except that someone will, except that someone will come someday to collect. Thank you.
Liza Whelan is my colleague in the fiction writing program at Fresno State. When we were getting ready to hire her, um, one of my duties was to call her, and I, I noticed the area code was an Atlanta area code. And uh, I asked her at some point in our conversation, are you Southern? And her answer was, not like you are. <laughs> um, nonetheless, she's written a novel, The Names of the Lost, which is set in Atlanta and concerns the Atlanta child killings of a few years ago. She's also written a lot of fine poems and stories that have been published in some of the best journals in the country, uh, such as Georgia Review, Missouri Review, Plowshares, and Black Warrior Review. There's a curious thing that happens to me when I fall in love with a piece of fiction, which is that I recall what my surroundings were when I read it. And I can tell you I've read a lot of her stories in the last year, and I remember what room I was sitting in and what objects were near me when I read each of them. Liza. Thanks, Steve. You just gave most of my introduction, so you spared me the, the agony of it. Um, the chapters that I'm going to read um, are two from the novel, and they actually don't have very much to do with that part of the setting that Steve just described. Um, there are two chapters that actually occur outside Atlanta. They take place on the road. Um, and the first is spoken by a character named Joe Ithaca. Um, the novel, in fact, is spoken by nine different characters. Um, Joe Ithaca is a Vietnam vet who's blind in one eye, um, deals in antiques. And he met another of the characters, Ray Gresham, um, up in Vermont. And Joe is driving to Atlanta to help Ray look for his father. I left Burlington first thing in the morning, heading south on Route 7, Georgia bound. I pictured myself fresh out, cutting a swath of daylight the length of the eastern United States until I got to below the Mason-Dixon line and night would start to come on again. I wanted to say it out loud to somebody, yell at all the sleepers in their beds, wake up, you sons of bitches, Middlebury and Brandon and Rutland, where I pulled into a diner for breakfast. By the time I hit North Bennington, the world was greener than I'd ever seen it, almost tropical, big trees tangled together, high, flat-faced hills, landscape that seemed to me this time through would admit no man entrance. It spooked me if I own up to it. I pulled off the road in Hoosick, New York, to call my mother in Richmond. It was my dad that answered the phone, so I hung up, thinking to try again later. I drove on 7 west toward <coughs> Troy, but it was only a half hour further, just outside Pittstown, that I stopped to call her again. These woods were getting to me something awful, the morning fog making the pine trees look like brown signposts with the sign part lopped off. If I'd stopped the car, gotten out, and turned around once, I'd have been lost. The very road felt like it was sinking under my tires. I didn't see how I was going to get around Tom Hannock Reservoir without sliding in off the shoulder. Somehow I got this notion that talking to her would make it all make sense. It was one of those ideas gets into your head and you can't explain it except that you know it's right. On the second try, here outside Ursula's Ursa Major Souvenirs, I get her on the phone. Did you just call, she says. Yeah, I say. She won't need an explanation. I thought so. Where are you? I hear trucks. I tell her. I tell her I'm taking a vacation and I'm on my, my way down to Atlanta to help a kid find his father. She doesn't ask a lot of questions, my mother. She figures I'll make my intentions clear to her in my own good time. I know it breaks her heart that the old man and I don't speak. She keeps at us both in her quiet way, telling me he's getting old and forgetful covering the receiver and telling him, Joe's on the phone, loud because he's also just about stone deaf. I'll hear some noises that sound like a helicopter far off and know that it's him talking, telling her he has nothing to say, the little blade of his voice chopping at the air around my head. I don't let it get to me anymore. I know how to settle my thoughts on the next piece of news I've got for my mother, the words I'll say as soon as she comes back on the line. Today she tells me, your father says you be careful down there. He says in Atlanta, people just as soon kill you as look at you. 
I want to tell her he didn't say any such thing and she knows it. But then I'm not sure. I hang up the phone and think on it all the way through Troy and on to I-88. I'm feeling more like myself now, but it's one long, lonesome stretch of road to Binghamton. You drive towards Cooperstown and try to remember any single paragraph of James Fenimore Cooper to get you through. But all I can recall are the two sisters out of the last of the Mohicans, Cora and Alice, one dark-haired and one blonde, who always reminded me of the Parker girls from Richmond High School, one of them real prissy and the other probably out looking for some hot-blooded brave at this very moment. My thoughts go on like this, then there's a second or two when I think about that sentence my dad might have or might not have said, and my heart seizes up for nearly a mile. I wait for it to pass, trying to gauge the grade of this land, keeping lookout for runaway truck ramps, even though I'm safe as sin in the Chevy Malibu. Seems like the highway from Oneonta to Binghamton runs all downhill, from the top of the earth down into it, deeper and deeper, where you cross the state line at Great Bend, PA. You start to want to take your foot off the gas, open all the windows, and let fly. You want to take some chances. But here I am, sliding down the ankles of the Adirondacks, going slower and slower, trying to remember what my father's voice sounds like and how it might have said those words about just as soon kill you as look at you. Toward Nineveh, New York, I can hear the soft drawl, the flat vowels, the higher register that his voice used to skip into when he'd run out of breath at the ends of sentences. Then it's my voice, too, banging itself around inside this old machine. I hit the gas, pressing the pedal to the floor. I want to get there, get to Ray, his mother, his sister. I'm tired of being alone. I make ace time between home and Binghamton, so I stop here for lunch. There's a Holiday Inn you can see practically from the New York State Thruway, a big new one, the kind of place there'd be a restaurant. They'd know how to get you lunch and let you get back on the road. This is fancier than most, eight stories of motel stacked on top of a glassed-in pool and a lobby that goes on for miles. The restaurant is supposed to feel like outside in the Orient with red paper umbrellas and chopstick bird cages, so I sit myself down at a table with a good view of the gift shop and as close to the door as I can get. Being outside in an unknown Asian country wouldn't be my idea of a good time. Next to the maitre d' station, a girl is waiting for takeout. She orders a turkey club and two beers, and they bring her the beers first, but forget to open them. I can see she has a real thirst on, so I stand up and reach across the table to hand her my pocket knife. I don't even say here, and she doesn't thank me, just opens the beers and hands back the knife. Her smile takes my breath away a little. It makes me want to do something else, just to see it come across her face like that again. She lifts one of the beers by the neck and takes a long drink, breathing hard after the bottle leaves her lips. Her shoulders drop, and when she turns and bends to set the beer back down on the table beside her, a hank of black hair falls across her face. <coughs> At this moment, I wonder if I've ever seen anything like this woman growing all loose and sleepy before my very eyes. She yawns then, and I think how much I'd like to stop here and go upstairs and watch her eat and fall asleep with the television going on low and the afternoon coming on into evening, and me not knowing a thing about her. Maybe I wouldn't even touch her, or just hold her hand until I was sure she didn't need me anymore. The waiter brings her sandwich in its white styrofoam hamper, which she tucks under her arm. When he asks what room number to put on the bill, she tells him, and I say that number over to myself, all through lunch, in fact, all afternoon, dropping down I-81 into Pennsylvania. <coughs> Driving south, I imagine her upstairs in that room, eating her lunch, drowsing between the last bites and the second bottle of beer. I see her watching Phil Donahue, something she would never dream of doing in her life off the highway. It's a show about Vietnam vets, and I'm one of Phil's guests. I'm only doing it for the money because times are a little hard lately. <coughs> I vow to myself in the network limo on my way to the studio that I won't say a word and I won't commiserate. I won't let my voice get thick and halting on national television, won't give those whores the half hour of gripping human drama they want. She's watching me, this dark-haired woman in a motel room in New York State, and she's falling in love with me right then and there. She's eating her sandwich more and more slowly, then finally she pushes the whole container away and comes to sit on the end of the bed, up real close to the TV. 
She watches me shake my hand and keep silent when Phil asks about the innocent women and children at Me Lai. Tears come into her eyes, but she doesn't know why. She leans closer to the set so she won't miss a single word if I speak, but I never do. Her blood runs faster and warmer through the vast dark mileage of her veins when I look straight into the cameras. I am the man she's been waiting for all these years. When Phil, when Phil breaks for station identification, she gets up from the bed and goes to the window. She holds the beer bottle to her forehead and thinks how glad she is that it's raining because that's how her life feels to her these days. She looks across the parking lot and back down I-81 behind her, letting her eyes drift west toward Chicago, toward the set of Donahue's show, thinking how she'll go there tomorrow instead of north to Albany, Troy, Saratoga Springs, Glens Falls. She'll go to Chicago and find me in the lobby of my hotel or coming up the beach with all of Lake Michigan spread out behind me. There's nothing else she can do. In every state, I stop at the Welcome Center for coffee and brochures, flirt a little with the nice ladies from the Chamber of Commerce, and leave with directions to the best antiques in four or five counties. They're always, always surprised to find a man in the trade. Sometimes I tell them I have a pretty good eye for the stuff, and then they look at me hard for a minute, trying to decide if I mean it as a joke. Usually I have to laugh first, and then they will. When I, get, when I get to Atlanta, I'll read all these brochures, the literature, as they call it. Most of what I pick up is battlefields, Gettysburg, Antietam, Bunker Hill, Harper's Ferry, Manassas, Fredericksburg and Spotsylvania, Cowpens, Chickamauga. I figure I'll play tourist on my way back north. Some of them were hard to pass by, though, the battlefields close to the highway. You could see them coming at you for miles back, the ground hollowing itself out or rising up suddenly to form strongholds like Bunker Hill and Little Round Top. Maybe it's just me, but I swear you can smell a battlefield on the horizon. The air would get full of a thin, thin clean, sweet smell, like before a rainstorm, only with more bite to it. A guy I used to know said it had to do with decaying bodies, <coughs> blood-soaked soil, and carbon half-lives. Whatever it is, he's part of it now, back at Quezon. The only one I might have stopped at was Gettysburg. There's a story about my father's grandfather, a tinker from Philadelphia, who spent the years before the war mending knives, splinting the broken legs of household pets, shoveling shit, and predicting the weather. He fought with Union troops at Gettysburg, and one morning, when he was heeding the call of nature, he was surprised by an infantryman from Georgia who offered him tobacco, which he took, wished him a long life, or at least the full light of another day and then disappeared into the mist. It's the kind of story you never even consider doubting. I like to picture my great-grandfather lying awake in the patch of wet grass he dropped into, thinking of the soldier from Georgia and not having a goddamn clue about what either one of them was doing still alive in that field. I can see him deciding he'd go to Georgia as soon as the war was over. He was a smart man, and as such, he could predict more than the weather. He knew at Gettysburg which way that ill wind was blowing, and he thought he might be useful down south, a man whose life had been spared by a southerner. He never got to Georgia, but he got through the rest of that dark morning in late June, 1863, lying awake, squinting through the haze of stale powder and stinking humid air. I know he tried his damnedest to listen, too, through the groans and cries and whispers of the dying, trying to listen for the breathing of the man next to him, whose eyes had stayed open all night. I know he wondered if those eyes could still see anything, and he thought of all the people he'd be willing to die for, and prayed the only prayer he knew, which was a lot of questions, one right after the other. He prayed he was close to God, prayed for a little bit of light, not daylight though, maybe just a flame or lightning, enough to see a face, a jacket, the white of an eye. And then, just before he fell asleep, he asked God to let him die gloriously, but not today. I know because it's every soldier's prayer, and it'll come back at the strangest times, like just before dawn, heading into Atlanta, Georgia, riding alone into a strange, murderous town with only your father's voice to guide you. <coughs> Thank you.
the second chapter that I'm going to read, um, and these, these come about 100 pages apart and deep into the, into the novel, is spoken by a character named Robbie Lynn Wilkins, um, who happens to be the love interest of the aforementioned uh, Ray Gresham. She's since taken off for Tennessee, or you see her taking off for Tennessee. Um, and she's leaving Atlanta with her brother Sam, from whom she's been separated since the deaths of their parents. Um, she's also <coughs> just convinced the pizza delivery guy to sell her his car. He said, it would surely get me to West Texas, maybe farther, 25 miles to the gallon. He said, look, it's a black falcon, and at night, no one will be able to see you. I'm going to be Sam's legal guardian in one of these states, maybe Mississippi. They have different laws there. What's yours is yours, and if somebody tries to take it away, you do what you have to. In Utah, Alabama, Sam finally falls asleep. There's a lady DJ on a radio station out of Birmingham named Jewel. She's eating her supper while she talks, telling all us good folks about a storm coming on up out of the Gulf. By the time I cross the state line west of Cuba, it'll be right on top of us. Thunder and lightning, she says. Wind's gonna whip you around by the scruff of your neck and send you back where you come from. Down in Lake Charles, there's flooding, train tracks submerged, and two days worth of passengers stranded <coughs> all along the Gulf. Hard rain and thunderstorms every hour on the hour. <coughs> Masses of electrified air hanging between here and Corpus Christi. I can picture it. I've heard how in Texas, the lightning shoots up from the ground instead of down through the atmosphere. With my eyes closed, I could make it happen in my head. Streaks of heat and light climbing as high as they can, then falling back down under the horizon. These storms turn the sky green, a shade between gray and purple. It's the color of a bellyache, that dull pain you get from eating too much or too little or thinking about things too hard or losing something that belongs to someone else. Keep talking, Jewel. You've got a lot to tell me about the new world. I try to picture her, somebody with the name Jewel. She must have the bluest eyes or the greenest or the blackest, but what kind of Jewel would that be? All I can think of is coal. Her father and mother must have looked at her in her crib and thought they'd never seen anything like those eyes looking up at them out of that sweet face. Just by the look in his eyes, I knew Ray would find some way to go. Knew it all of May, June, July. He has the bluest eyes, and for weeks now, they've been staring off past my face, over my shoulder, his vision running ahead of him up some road. <coughs> Maybe this one I'm on right now. He never would say where his father was, only that he knew and was going after him. Why, Ray? He won't come back with you. You just don't get it, do you, Robbie? No, I guess I must not. We looked at each other for a while, him at the wheel and me where Sam is now, leaning my head on the window. Then he reached over to touch me and I pulled away. I'm not going to be here when you get back. It sounded like talk out of a movie, not like my voice or words I would say. I knew what I wanted then, for the first time, I wanted Ray to say he'd take us with him. I turned my face toward him and waited, my whole body aching toward his, off balance where all the want and need in me gathered on that side. The words got so loud in my head that for a second I thought he'd said them. Your face catches all the light, the lookout, the pole star. You'll always be here. You'll wait for me. I left six hours after he did. I only had to wait for it to get dark so I could get Sam the way we always did it. It's too scary for me here, right, Robbie? Sam said. I could get kidnapped like all the other children. That's right, Sam. In the morning, we stop at a Kmart in Tuscaloosa, and I buy him a week's worth of clothes, shorts and shirts, socks and underwear. I buy him pajamas with baseball players running all over them, looking to make unbelievable life-saving plays. I buy him a toothbrush and a bag of candy bars to balance things out. He wants coloring books, crayons, and colored paper, but more than anything else, he wants maps, a new one every day. He learns the names of the towns as we get close to them, Fosters, Ralph, Marion, Epps, and on into Bonita, Newton, Pulaski, Homewood, and he's sad when we've left each one behind. 
He draws his own maps of places we haven't been, states that don't exist. He makes ovals of orange with black lines branching out in all directions. Whole states of these spider webs, no mountains, no water, just miles and miles of road. He makes 50 pictures and says these are the states he knows. Their names are Mother, Daddy, Noreen, Gus, Mrs. Whitaker, and Kmart. There's a state called Ray and one <coughs> called Heaven. <coughs> Today is Sam's sixth birthday, or it will be as soon as Jewel makes it midnight over the airwaves. Robbie, when was I born? Today, Sam, you know that. No, I mean what time? I see what he's getting at. Already he knows about exact times and places. It'll make him a good navigator, and all at once I'm thinking this trip is the best thing we could have done. As I recall, it was a little after midnight. I'm lying, but it doesn't matter. You can lie once a week, I figure, without doing anybody harm. Sam strains forward to get a look in the rearview mirror, to watch himself changing from five to six. <coughs> and as he sits back, I can see it too, in the dark, the round boy's face getting longer and thinner, the jawbone wider and set more carefully, the eyes deeper in the face and more clouded. Then we pass beyond the farthest reaches of this town's lights, Eeps is its name, and I can't see anything. Outside Jackson, Mississippi, there's a truck stop with an all-night diner. The lights seem to pulse at us out of the dark. Look at that, Sam says, noticing it too. Let's stop there. Are you hungry, Sam? I'm six years old hungry, he says. Inside, you'd think it was another time of day, high noon instead of the middle of the night. The talk is so loud and the light comes at you from everywhere, the way strong sunlight does. Even though the windows are mostly papered over with truckers' pictures and postcards they've sent from further on down the line. In the lobby, truckers in cowboy boots talk on the telephone and wander down the aisles of automotive parts and supplies. The waitress's tag says her name is Lida. Even before he orders breakfast, Sam tells her it's his birthday. How old, she says, six and four hours. Lida's eyebrows jump up, then she gives me a wise look. Careful with them when they're this away, she says, jerking her thumb back at Sam. They could turn out either good or bad. I know what she means and I don't, too. I think how this is the beginning of information I'll have to start listening to and storing away for when Sam gets to this certain age or that certain age. I feel a wave of hurt for my parents for all I never knew about them. How could they have stood it when the lessons come like this, all out of order and from people you don't even know? We eat scrambled eggs that arrive cut in neat rectangles, sausage, home fries, and toast. I drink cups and cups of burning hot coffee and let Sam have a milkshake. It's his birthday, after all, Lida says, and I'm deep down relieved to hear she approves. She brings him a cheese danish with a candle stuck in the middle and starts in on happy birthday. Her voice rises in a cool, sweet billow over the whole restaurant, and the truckers join in. For a second, I think I'm going to cry, and I look at the window full of postcards until the feeling passes. After the singing, everybody claps, and then in twos and threes, the truckers get up and go out to the front leaving their breakfasts half eaten. They come back with presents for Sam, spark plugs, brake fluid, timing belts, <laughs> antifreeze, wiper blades, floor mats, a travel mug, road flares, a compass, a United States atlas, a bolo tie, and a Confederate flag. They all say a little bit about how sorry they are to be away from their children or their girlfriend's children or their grandchildren. They want us to forgive them these absences. When we get up to leave, Lida says our breakfast is paid for and there's a fill-up on the house. You send me a card every now and then, she tells Sam, and I'll put them on the window so we can keep track of you. We head on to Monroe, Louisiana, to Arcadia, and then Shreveport before crossing the Texas line east of Marshall. So far it's rained every day since we left, but this morning the sun comes out and it's near 90 degrees. The Falcon's temperature gauge is pushing up toward hot, so I take it slower, heading up back roads in the general direction of Amarillo. We get to where we like stopping by graveyards to eat lunch or for me to take a nap. They're usually cool and shady, and the ground seems to stay damp all day long. Sam climbs on the headstones and looks for names he knows. I call the Gresham's house from Lake Arrowhead outside Wichita Falls, 
but there's no answer, and I'm just as glad because I'm not sure what I would have said to any of them, especially Ray. I've been having hundreds of conversations with him in my head, times I've said, I hate it how it always happens the same way, with him leaving and driving to the end of the street, where there's a million ways he can turn, north, south, east, or back, and then he's gone. I stand at the window tearing up paper and sailing the scraps after him. The sound they make is a whisper, the cry of his name lost somewhere inside me, or else it's the one question that would make him turn around and come back. We'll haunt each other, me and Ray. There's no other way to say it. We're the kind of ghost that's all body, skin, and real bones, filled up with gravity, bumping into walls and doors instead of passing on through them. We're the kind that can't ever get out of their graves. Some night Sam and I will be leaving one town or other. We'll drive past a cemetery, and the car's lights flicker blood red over the gravestones on and off like the voices of the dead, <coughs> talking to each other in these fits and starts of light. Sam always notices. He loves it so much he wants me to turn the car around so we can pass by again, and sometimes I do. What do you think they're saying, he asks. I don't know, but I do know. It's the same question they always ask each other. How did it happen? How did you come to be here lying next to me with your eyes wide open? Tonight at Esteline, Texas, there's one of these graveyards, but this time there's a wreck ahead of us, a fire, and then a helicopter taking up the injured. In my head, I can hear them. It's like flying, they say. We're not ready, mistaking copter blades for angels' wings chopping at the stars. I see the car's lights making more talk in the graveyard, see the dead ache for this rising up they now bear witness to. The dead are so much better than we are, the way the dust of their bones billows up when they touch gently, when they cry, cry out, how sweetly they whisper each other's names. There'll be a reception outside, and please feel free to go back and see the Kalima exhibit, which just opened up. Thanks. <laughs>